All right, let's look at the 2023 AP Physics C Mechanics. This is the set two free response questions. All three I'm gonna do in a single video just because I might, I don't know, you guys want me to cut it up, I guess I could cut it up, but just because there's two sets of mechanics, two sets of e and I was just trying not to overdo it in the number of videos here. All right, so if there are any corrections, I will put as a pinned comment. Inevitably, I will get something wrong. I will misread something just Put a comment in it, read the pinned comment, make sure um, you know I've, I've caught it, or if I haven't caught it, then just let me know. Scientists have created a new type of lightweight foam and are performing experiments to investigate the properties of the foam. The mass of card A is 1,000 kilograms, mass of card B is 2,000 kilograms, a piece of foam is negligible. So, okay, so, all right, let's just 1,000 kilograms, 2,000 kilograms, and the, ma the foam has negligible mass. Cart A moves with constant speed towards cart B, which is initially at rest. Okay, fine, velocity zero, it makes sense. Zero seconds, the foam is connected to cart A, connected to cart A makes contact with cart B. The foam remains in contact with cart B for 0.5 seconds after the carts separate and both cars move with constant velocities, okay? The graph shows the velocity of cart A as a function of time for the time interval when the foam and the cart are in big contact. So there's a velocity versus time. You should be thinking the integral, the area gives you the accelerate, sorry, displacement. The slope gives you the velocity. What feature of the graph can we use to estimate the displacement of the cart? Well, that would be the area under the graph from t equals zero to t equals 0 0.5 seconds. Using information shown in the graph, determine the speed of cart B at 0.5 seconds. So at 0.5 seconds, we're just going to look at the Y. Okay, so this is the cart A speed. And, you know, we have a collision. We're going to do a conservation of momentum. So we're going to say MA times VA is equal to then after the collision, MA moves at some new velocity and MB moves with some, some velocity. Because, you know, on this side, cart B has no velocity, so there's no momentum here. So, um... What do we know? We know the masses are 1,000 and 2,000. So this is going to be 1,000. And what was the velocity before the collision? Well, I guess it's like right here. The velocity before the collision is 5. Then 1,000 times what's the velocity after the collision? It's 1. And then the MB is 2,000. Do I have those right? Just to make sure 1,000 and 2,000. OK, yep. And then yeah, times the velocity of B. So then we can solve for the velocity of B. So. I don't know, what's that fourth? It's like two meters per second, I think, when you do that. I will use my calculator to confirm. I've been getting a little sloppy with my arithmetic lately. Yeah, that's two. On the following grid, draw a smooth curve of velocity B as a function of time. So um, if you think about velocity B, it's basically whatever change in momentum of cart A has to be like a the velocity of cart B. So cart B starts at zero, he ends at two. Right, and it should kind of have this kind of sh like, like when he slows down very little, he's gonna like change very little, and when he changes the most, it's gonna be almost like it should just have like an inflection, kind of like this. I don't know if they want you to calculate another point. If you really had the time and the interest, you could pick like other points in there, but I think practically speaking, the velocity of b should be half of the difference of the velocity, just given the ratio here, right? So this difference is four, so then this would be like two. This difference from 5 to, say, 3 is 2. So right at this point, it should be like 1, right? So I think I think that would be pretty good. That would be good enough, I would say. Um, the velocity of cardiac can be described by this function. Calculate the magnitude of the maximum, maximum net force. So maximum net force is equal to ma. What is a equal to? It's to the derivative. It's going to be 3 times, I don't know, what's 64 times 3. I can't do that in my head. 192 t squared minus 48t. Okay, so that's what the a is. If I want this to be max, I want this to be max. So how do I find the maximum of an acceleration? You could graph it. You could just take the derivative. I'm, you know, just take the derivative of this, set it equal to zero to find the time at which the maximum occurs. Whichever way, you don't have to do it this way. You could just simply graph it. But then we're going to plug that into there. And so the a max is going to be 192 times this number squared minus 49 times that number. And I get uh, negative 487, which is fine. So then, um, so the F net is going to, or the F max is going to be 1000. 
uh, this is the velocity of cart A times negative 487. Okay, so times a thousand. So negative 487,000. So I get 487,000. You just, you know, put the units there like that. Magnitude is always positive, so you don't have to keep it negative. The negative is just telling you, I guess, uh, I don't know. You could plot it. You could see where the, you could plot the, this guy here. Oh, why did I say 49? This is 48. Oh, gosh. It's not even 48. It's like 96. I don't know what I'm doing here. This is why you should applaud it and not just use 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 this. Um, 96 divided by 384. My bad. So this is 0 0.25. We're going to plug that into there. Minus 12. Okay, so minus 12. Ugh. Hate erasing. Okay, minus 12, or if max is 12,000 newtons. You don't have to worry about the negative, because when I say magnitude, they don't care about it's positive or negative. Falling grid, draw a smooth curve of magnitude of the force acting on cart A as a function of time, clearly indicate. All right, so you want to plot this thing, right? So your F net is going to be this. At T equals zero, I don't know, I, I, it, it's quadratic, right? So just pick two points, and the maximum occurs at like negative 12. Oh, they want the magnitude of the force, so it's going to be positive 12,000. So, and that occurs at 0.25, so might as well just make this uh, 4, 4, 8. Okay, so 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. Let's make this 12,000. Each of these is like 2,000. Okay, so the max occurs at 0.25 seconds, so we know the max is right here, and then it's a parabola. So you just kind of like pick, like if I plug in zero. 192 times 0, oh, then it's just going to be 0 here. And if I plug in like 0 0.5, 192 times 0 0.5 squared, minus 96 times 0 0.5, oh. It's also going to be 0 here, so it's going to be a parabola that goes like this. Um, the foam is removed from the front of cart A and experiment is repeated. The carts collide, both cart A and B having the same initial and final velocity as the original collision. The time intervals during which the carts are in contact are different in the collision with the foam and the collision without the foam. In the collision with the foam, cart A is in contact with a shorter duration than the original collision. The foam is present for the original collision. When the foam is present, the magnitude of the average net force is F1. If the collision without the foam, the magnitude of the net force is F2. What is the relationship? Well, so basically FDT is going to be the same, same change in momentum. So you're thinking about in this one, you have the same change in momentum. It is the same in both instances because they're telling you the velocities before and after are the same. However, the time interval, the time interval, the time is greater, is shorter, which means that if this is the same value, then the F has to be bigger. So for cart two, F2 is bigger. Like this one is because it's the same change in momentum, same impulse because it's the same change in momentum. Therefore, a shorter time means a greater F. Okay. All right, that's the first FRQ. Let's look at the second one. Student conducts an investigation to determine the relationship between the period of oscillation T in a system consisting of a block and N attached springs. Okay. Student starts with a block of mass little m attached to a single ideal spring of spring constant k as shown in figure one. Student holds the block so the spring is neither stretched nor compressed at a vertical height of one meter above the, so, so uh, figure one, neither stretched nor compressed. This is the relaxed length. The student releases the block from rest and records the period of oscillation of the system consisting of a single spring and block. An additional identical spring is attached in parallel as shown in figure two, and the procedure is repeated for n equals two springs. This procedure is repeated through n equals 10 springs. Derive an expression for t as a function of n. Express your answers in terms of m, k, n, and physical constants. Okay, so we got to set up, easiest way to do this is to set up the differential equation. That's probably the most straightforward way. And when you're doing harmonic motion, basically the, um, the, the, the standard form is going to be its negative omega squared x, right? So we want the, and th this is the acceleration. How, how do you get this? Is you do f net equals ma. Now, as it moves, so this is a little tricky. As it moves, you got to think about the free body diagram. We're going to have mg here, and then you're going to have n times kx going upwards. 
Now, when you do the net force, let's say down is the positive direction, then your net force is going to be um, mg minus nkx is equal to m times the second derivative. Oh, actually, this is this is not something that's really super easy to do. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, this is a little bit tricky to explain in terms of um, how it how it connects to this differential equation. So. Um, I think the argument you might make, because I, I don't want to do any kind of advanced differential equation stuff for you. So you can't make it look like this necessarily, which is a little bit tricky on the vertical mass spring one. So I don't think there's like an easy way to derive it without me explaining how to solve a differential equation like this. So you would not use this method in all likelihood for, vert I forgot for vertical mass spring, we can't do this. We really have to think about how does the equivalent spring work when there are multiple springs. So I want you to think about maybe the equilibrium position. Okay. So what you might think about is what's the effective spring when I have multiple springs kind of in parallel. And this is something that's a little bit tricky. So you either like look at this, but you, you, from this differential equation, you can almost think about it like, oh, what did I do? What is, how is this different from n equals one mg minus kx, which is m. Maybe, maybe this is probably the easiest way to think about this is to think about like for this one, we know the period is two pi root m over k. Okay, that's what we know for a vertical mass. If you have this differential equation for a single spring, you're gonna get this. For this one, okay, what did we do is we just make k times n. So like really it's gonna be t is equal to two pi instead of a single k, it's gonna be n times k. And you could use that as kind of your proof. You just say like, well, the k becomes n times k, right? Okay, and you can see that from the free body diagram of what we did is the spring forces are just going to get multiplied. So the spring constant gets multiplied like that. So that's probably the easiest way to, to prove that. On the axis, sketch the graph of t as a function of n for n equal to greater than or equal to 1. So it's 1 over root. So when n is 1, it's like here. And then, sorry, n equals, not, it's n equals, it's like n equals 1, 2, 3. So like it's here, but then it's going to be like 1 over square root. So it's going to do something like that. Starts with n equals one, probably. I think you can sketch a curve. Technically, they should be integers. There's not such thing as like one and a half n, but I think it's okay to sketch a curve there. Technically, they should be like dots, right? At fixed integer points. Um, student plots t squared as a function of one over n as n to the negative one. Draw the best fit line of the data. So why do they do, oh yeah, t squared. Okay, that makes sense, they do t squared. So draw best fit line of the data. There, there's a best fit line. Uh, mass of the block is measured of this. Use the graph to calculate the experimental value of the spring constant. So here you're going to have t is equal to, we're going to, you know, do the, our t is equal to 2 pi root m over nk. 2 pi root um, m over n times k. And we're graphing, it, we're graphing the square. So let's square this thing. Square is going to be 4 pi squared m over nk. And they wanted you to plot, and if you bring out the m over k times 1 over n, now you can see we're plotting the y value is t squared. The x value is 1 over n, right? Like right there. And so the slope is going to equal 4 pi squared m over k. Okay. And that's going to equal the slope that we calculate here. So let's pick two points that are easy to read. Let's just pick this point here. This point is 0 0.9 comma, what is these? These are by 0 0.5 each. Yeah, so 10.5. And then we'll pick, what's another point? This point's easy to read. This is 0 0.3 comma, this is 3, 3.5, right? So then the slope is going to be 10.5 minus 3.5 over 0 0.9 minus 0 0.3. And so you're going to get 7 over 0.6. <clears throat> okay, and then divided by 4, divided by pi squared um, is m over k. And then, so I get m over k when I do this is like 0 0.2955. The m is 1.5. So then you just solve for k. I'm going to do 1 over that times 1.5. So I get the k is 5.08 newtons per meter. 
The student finds that the value given by the manufacturer's spring constant is larger than the value determined experimentally in part C2. Determine a single source of experimental error that could result in the observed difference in the value for K. Briefly justify your answer. Um, what would be the easiest thing to describe on this thing? Um, you know, we assume that the spring is, um, we say it's larger or smaller. It's spring constant is larger than the value determined. Um, well, the spring has some mass. So you probably neglect that there's some mass in the spring in itself. And so that's being folded into there into like, it's part of our calculation. Cause we didn't include, we assumed that the mass was zero for the springs. So that means when we do our M over K kind of thing, we're assuming it's the mass of the springs. But the, let's see, the value manufacturer of the spring constant is larger. So if we, you know, if if this M is actually bigger than what we put in, then the K would have to be bigger to compensate for that, right? So like, I think that would be, I don't know, I would just say something to that effect. I would say um, the larger, the, the springs have some mass negligible mass that is not accounted for and you would say like well you know so a larger you know sort of m on the springs would imply that let me try to reason that out if so th this number is too small, like it should be bigger almost. It's not exactly, cause it's like the mass of the spring is not part of it. Like it's more complicated than that. But let's just as assume that like you undercounted the mass. So like really this number is actually bigger, but we assume a smaller number. And so I think the K would be, if I were to account for that, then the K would actually be bigger. Yeah, the K should be bigger, would be bigger. I don't know if there's an easier way to describe that. You could say, that's probably the easiest way. I don't know, like it's supposed to be brief. I wouldn't spend too much time thinking about that. Student conducts a similar investigation to determine the relationship of the period of oscillation consisting of block and N number of N identical springs, but arranges the block spring system horizontally on the table as shown in figure three. Frictional forces between the table and block are negligible. In each trial, the block is displaced the same horizontal distance and released from rest. Students plot t squared as a function of n for this new date. Would the slope of the best fit line from this new investigation be greater than less than or equal to or same as the slope of the best fit line? Um, because the period equation is identical, it would be the same. That's because the period equation equals two pi root m over k is the same for horizontal and vertical mass springs. When n equals one, the maximum speed of the block is found to be v max. When n increases, will v max be increased? So I think what we're doing is we're displacing it. Let's see. Uh, each trial of the block is displaced the same horizontal distance. So what's going to happen is when you increase n, um, or when you're increasing the number of springs, your your energy is n times k times x squared because you're using the same spring stretching, but now you've increased the springs because like there's multiple springs. So if you've increased the amount of potential energy in the springs, you're going to increase this because you have more spring potential energy with more springs at the same distance. Stretched. And that implies more kinetic energy, which is 1 half mv squared. The mass, the m doesn't change. m isn't changing. So v increases. Okay, let's look at this third one, the rotational version. So wind turbine includes a three blade system that rotates about an axis through the end of each blade as shown in the figure one. Each blade has a length L, mass M with the center mass located distance L over three from the axis of rotation. So there's the center of mass right here. Derive an expression for the rotational inertia of the three blade system. Express your answer in terms of M, L, and the constants appropriate. The rotational inertia of each blade about the axis through its center is given by this. 1 18th ml squared. So this is parallel axis theorem. If I want the rotational, like, like if I want the rotational inertia from the center of mass to the actual axis of rotation, I know that I know through here, I know the I of the center of mass, you get the I is going to equal 
I of the center of mass plus MD squared. That's the parallel axis theorem. So what is the center of mass? It's 1 18th ML squared. And then that is, you're going to shift, they're telling you that distance there is L over 3. So it's M times L over 3 squared. So this is for a single blade, okay? Is that, and then you're gonna have three of them. So if you want the rotational, wait, they, of the three blade system, you have to multiply that by three ultimately. So this is 1 18th ML squared plus 1 9th ML squared. And that's gonna be, what's 1 over 18? My brain is a little fried because I'm 1 6th ML squared. And then, so then you do three times the I blades because you got three of them. So that's gonna be 1 half ML squared. Oh, nice and simple that it end up, so three times 1 6 is 1 half. While the wind blows, the three blade system operates at a constant angular speed. The length of one blade is 36 meters. The numerical value of the rotational inertia of the system is that. Calculate the T. It takes the outer edge of the blade to complete one revolution. Okay. Um, I don't know. Uh, that's the period, right? The period is just equal to 2 pi over omega. Right? So... Uh, honestly, it doesn't really matter the length there. You could do a lot of things. They, they're, they're giving you a lot of this stuff, but it's just, it's, it's, this is the angular speed. And you just want to know how long it takes for it to go one revolution. That's the period, right? So 2 pi over 2.6. I'm trying to think why they, did they just try to confuse you with a bunch of stuff? So 2.42 radians per second, right? Like, I already know the, that's a time, that's a kinematics analysis, right? So you can just write out kinematics if you want. But this is just constant. So, um, When the wind stops blowing, the angular speed of the system decreases. The angular speed omega of the system while slowing down is given by this function. Okay, Calculate the amount of energy dissipated from t equals 0 when the wind stops blowing until the system comes to rest. So energy dissipated would be, um, I don't know, just 1 half i omega final squared minus 1 half i omega not squared, right? Like when the wind stops blowing. So we're going to end up with 0 kinetic energy. And we're going to have, did they give you the I? They gave you the I is 6.7 times 10 to the 6. And what's the initial angular velocity is, um, I don't know, you're supposed to read this or being or not? Uh, I oh, yeah, 2.6. They gave it to there. Never mind, 2.6. I was going to say, do I read off the graph? Yeah, that's about 2.6. Okay. 0. 0.5 times 6.7 E6 times 2.6 squared. So that's just the change in energy. So that's going to be 2.26 times 10 to the 7 joules. Uh, yeah. Are the units of I correct? Kilogram meter squared? Yeah, that's fine. Derive an expression for the net torque exerted on the system as a function of t as the system slows down. Express your answer here. So here, net torque equals I alpha. Okay, so we have I cis, that's fine. Alpha is equal to the derivative of the omega, right? So we know what the omega is. It's omega naught e, e to the negative beta t. So what's the derivative of that? It's negative beta omega naught e to the negative beta t. And so we're just going to plug that into here. The net torque is going to be negative beta omega naught i cis e to the negative beta t. That's it. Derive an expression for the angular displacement as a function of t. Express your answer in terms of this. So angular displacement is just going to be the integral from 0 to some time of this thing, right? Of the angular velocity. This is just kinematics, right? So it'd be negative omega naught over beta e to the negative beta t from 0 to t. Plug in t, plug in 0, I think you're going to get 1 minus omega naught over beta e to the negative beta t. And you can confirm that. Is the derivative of that equal to that thing? Yeah, it would work. Okay. Uh, Three-blade system now replaced with the second three-blade system, identical to the first, except the second three-blade system slows down the corner of this equation. Uh, where beta is greater than beta naught. Oh, is there a beta naught in this? Jeez. Okay. Well, that's going to be confusing. So I should put a beta naughts everywhere. I mean, it's like not any different, but like, you know, now that we're having a different letter, it's, it's better that I'm very clear on here. 
on the graph sketch the angular speed of the second three blade system as a function of time. So basically this exponential, if this is bigger, then it's just gonna like drop off steeper. Like it's gonna start at the same spot, but it's just going to like be, it's just gonna drop off faster. Okay, so that is something like that. Oh, was that it? Oh, uh, on the graph sketch for, oh, that was it. Okay. Um, all right, I guess that was the whole test.